Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to be working on 9.5, day two today. So we're going to finish up the course arc and we'll work on the notebook uh, number five through eight today um, on financial policy. All right, so let's jump in and get started. So please have both those open. I was telling you that as you came in the class, please open up the notebook and the course arc. Okay, but first for our bell ringer, all right, um, what are you doing for spring break? Are you staying in town? Are you going to hang out with friends? Are you going out of town? What are you doing? Are you working? What are you doing? What are you doing for spring break? I'm in town most of the time. We're going to go to Arizona for like two days. Yeah. We're going to go to that bear zona reindeer thing. I don't know. Go see animals. So Addison, where are you going? Staying home? Nice. You're going to hang out with some, uh, say, hang out with some friends, Kaylee, or what are you going to do? You going to Arizona also, Addison? Do you have family there? You're going to Arizona. What is Arizona? You guys so it's right know? outside. It's it's cool. It's, so it's right outside the Grand Canyon. It's about 30 minutes or so from the Grand Canyon. And it's like a bear wolf, like conservation park and stuff. So you can like drive through and see these different animals, you know. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of people told me it's really good. And that you should either go like in the spring or the fall. Like don't go in the winter or don't go in the summer. Okay. And stuff. So um, probably hang out with friends. Birthday, nice. I hope you do something fun. Sleep for real. I got a uh, plan like five miles. Oh, okay, cool. That's awesome. It's a pretty area there. I went to the Grand Canyon a few years ago and stuff like that. And I do, I, Williams is really pretty. So we're going to stay in Williams and go do that. And then have you ever been to the reindeer farm, Addison? I was debating about maybe doing that. I've had people tell me it was decent. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's like a big reindeer deer farm. Yeah, so I was thinking we were going to do Bears on a one day. And then maybe just go check out the Grand Canyon. My kids aren't, we're not really going to go hike it. We'll just be like, here it is. Cool. We came, we saw. We conquered. <laughs> close. Yeah, we conquered. Um, we, I'm not dragging my two down to the bottom and back. <laughs> I'll get more whining and have to give piggyback rides. Uh -huh. And then I was thinking we'd do the the reindeer thing like the next morning and then head back. So it's going to be a quick, like two days. On one site to check out Indian ruin. Oh, there's Indian ruins? By the Grand Canyon? Okay. Yeah, lots. Okay. Maybe go to the movies? Okay. Any good movies out? I recently saw, I'm sure I'm like way past it. I saw the new Avatar movie. So long. Oh my gosh. It was like three hours and 20 minutes. Two hours in, I was like, how much longer? I watched <laughs> a really good. bad movie recently. And I'm not advertising that you guys watch it because it's, I don't even know if it's age appropriate, but Cocaine Bear. Oh, wait, our neighbors said they saw that and they said they loved it. <laughs> it's not good. It's just hilariously dumb, which makes yeah. it good. It's based on a true story, right? Yeah, it's but the bear didn't actually do all of that. The bear just died. Like the actual cocaine bear oh. ate 75 pounds of cocaine and eventually it just found him. So this wow. is like an embellishment of what actually happened. Okay, like a spoof of it or something. Yeah, yeah I liked the new Avatar movie too. It was just really long. I just felt like they could have cut out, like, shortened some of the fighting scenes. Do you know what I mean? It just went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, Cocaine Bear is nothing like that. It's just pure idiocy. Yeah, I heard it's, like, just a lot of violence and funny, like, with humor intermixed and stuff. Yeah, our neighbors were, like, going, yeah, we saw it. We really got to like it. It sounds terrible, but we liked it. <laughs> it, well, it is terrible, but it was – It's don't funny. don't go over there trying to look for an Oscar winner because this yeah, it's just it is it. what it is. It is, it what, is it what it is. is. My brother wants to see it. Okay, so now you know it's it's funny, it's loosely based on a true story with embellishments. Right. And that's what I heard. I heard it's gory and funny. That's what I heard. Super so. gory, but it's like so stupid. It's like, <laughs> like if you were watching gummy bears come out of someone's stomach, that's how I feel about this. Okay. All right. I am I have a hard time with the gore. Like every other show I watch with my husband, like I have to like cover my face. So anytime they say gore, I'm like, <laughs> so. I mean, yeah, I covered my face a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong. Face. Like, I also think in a past life, I was a mob wife. I'm like, hey, they went against the family, you know? <laughs> like, so, you know, I'm not saying, like, you know, things don't have to be done. I just don't want to see it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, yeah, it, it's stupid. It's, stu it's a stupid movie. Okay, all right, good to know. And I'm joking about the mob wife, but I do love mob shows. Like, I swear, anything mob, I'm, like, obsessed. I don't know. So that's why I joke. I'm like, in a past life, I think I was like in a mob family. I was like, you 100%, know. I could have never been a mob wife. I could have been a mobster, not a mob see, wife. See, I can't do the violence, but I can sit back and be like, we got to do what we got to do. You know, so right. I'm nobody's cheerleader. Mm -mm. 
So I, um, I don't know. It's stuff like that. But I swear every mob movie. Check out a place in Kingman. Keepers of the Wild. All right. I'll write that down. Because I think that's on the way home. But I think we were going to go through. Okay. Keepers. You've had so many cool experiences, Addison. I know there's so much to do in Arizona. And I honestly, we've done a ton of stuff in California and Utah. But I have not really done a lot in Arizona. And I keep like, it's not that far. So. Why um, not? Yeah. Of the wild. My exciting thing that I was been in the mob over my great grandfather declined the offer. Really, Christian? That's so awesome. That's I mean, not awesome, but you know what I mean. Awesome. So he declined the offer. <laughs> Your family would have been in the mob. I'm obsessed with mom, so I can imagine if it accepted. Was that here or was that back in like Chicago or New York? Yeah. Have any of you been to the mob museum? It is amazing. Yeah. New York. Okay. The okay. mom museum is so amazing. It's so amazing. And like the history and like, and honestly, like how they got their rise and then how they ended up out here. And anybody who says that there is not shady deals that go on in this town, I'm like, are you kidding me? You're okay. asleep. Um, cool. Very cool. That's Very really cool. cool. All right. Well, to get to our interesting stuff, financial policy, <laughs> like after talking about the mob, like a cocaine bear, you know what I mean? Like, um, and stuff. So keepers, I'm going to write keepers of the wild. I'm going to write that down, Addison, look it up. That might be something on the way home and stuff. All right, let's get started. So make sure you have your notebook open, your course arc. All right. Anybody who watches this playback is going to be like, what the heck? So, right. Right. <laughs> okay. Sure. So um, it's a, hey, it's got to be entertaining. So, all right. So the four steps to setting the budget, speaking of my step grandpa, I believe we had an encounter with Al Capone. Nice. Okay. That's so cool. I'm going to draw something later. Is it going to be mob related, Tyreek? That's what we want to know. <laughs> no. Or is it going to be cocaine bear? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. Okay. So the four steps to setting a budget, the four steps we ran out of ideas. <laughs> yes, Christian. <laughs> what two things could we put together that people would never guess? <laughs> yeah. We've done Sharknado before. Yes, right, right. What, what, Sharknado, what, one, two, three? Isn't there four of them or something? There's like, yeah, so oh we had to. I mean, but the now thing is. Cocaine bear. Watch, there'll be a cocaine bear too. Yeah. You know? Or I said a cocaine bear, it'll be some other drug. I don't know. <laughs> so. All right. The four steps. I promise we'll get stuff done today. The four steps. So agencies have to submit their budget. So all those cabinet members that members that serve under the government. <laughs> Christian, you're killing me. You're killing me. I can't. I can't. You're so funny. The final line. That's not funny, but it's funny. You know what I mean? It's funny. Oh, it's funny. That's, that is funny. It's funny because it's not funny, but it's really funny. Yes. Okay. Oh. And now I crossed the line. Okay. Get it? The line. I crossed the line. Oh, okay. uh Oh my gosh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm not promoting drugs in Give any way, shape, or form. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you tell people that I am. Okay. <laughs> You're like, my teacher was joking about the line and <laughs> go game bear. Okay. The four steps <laughs> to setting a budget. All right. Um, agencies submit spending proposals. So all those cabinet members, uh, members of the president, right, submit their proposals. The president, the executive branch puts them in a nice package. Here's what we need. Sends them to Congress. Think of Congress as like the ones who write the check, okay, the names on the bank account. So they go through, they debate, they approve, disapprove, and this creates accountability so the president just can't have like a blank check or credit card and go crazy. And then once they approve it, it goes back to the White House. Okay, so let's go to number five really quick in your notebook. And number five says, I'm gonna have to move pretty fast. Okay, number five says, um, is that ultimately Congress is in control of the money. They sign the checks, right? The president and the agencies, they have to propose and basically ask for approval. And if they oppose each other, if the president and Congress can't agree, then this can cause a gridlock. And we have seen a couple of examples where the government actually shuts down, all right? And people like literally don't go to work. So it can be scary when that happens. But we need these checks and balances as much as we like to say, oh, let's get rid of it. Let's not worry about it. We need those checks and balances so that... Um, so that Congress or the president aren't just doing whatever they want. We need checks and balances. Okay. It is really important. Um, one of the lessons I have learned through studying history is that the most successful societies are not the extreme societies. Okay. So if you find yourself identifying to one extreme, and stuff that might be what's best for you, but that is different. What's best for you and what's best for everyone 
are going to always be different, okay? And the extremes usually only represent a smaller majority of the population. So the reason we want this checks and balances, even if one is Democrat, one's Republican, and they butt heads, is that usually what's best for society, I might not always agree with it personally, but what ends up being best for society is something somewhere in the middle, something somewhere between where the liberals feel and where the conservatives feel that things should be. Usually it's the compromise. And if you need evidence of that, look at the successful societies in history. When China was most successful, it was the Confucius balanced society. Um, when any society, the Romans, when were they most successful? When they had the representation and the balance of the Senate, you know, the, the most successful societies are when they have a sense of balance. And when they leave that balance, then they create instability. So with the budget, we need to make sure we're not going crazy with our spending. All right, that's number five. We're going to jump in and do a near pod, which talks about why do we have money? What is the function of money in our society and our economy? All right, let me reload this really quick. Get your phone out, get it ready. Go to nearpod.com. All right, here we go. I'll put the link in the chat and I'll put the code and please join. All right. I know it's hard to participate today. We're all tired. We're all over it. Believe me. But we need to do it. Okay, let me get the code here in the chat. All right. So one of those two methods, please join. Anybody else have that annoying family member that does like the large group chat? that nobody else really wants to be in? Or is that just my family? My mother-in-law always starts these group chats and puts everybody- I was just going to say that. Are you really? Yeah. My mother-in-law is always doing it. And like, just since I started class, I have like 10 messages. I'm like, oh my gosh. About I don't stuff care. you don't care about. About I stuff don't you don't care. care. I don't care. We Figure tried to tell me what we're doing. I know it's not that I don't love those family members. I just don't need to know what happened at the dentist office with grandpa's teeth. You know what I mean? Like I don't I love them. I just don't like them. I don't care about none of nothing they have to say at all. Zero. I just I mean, not that I don't love the family, but I'm like, I don't need to know. Like, contact me if it's something important about our relationship. I don't need to know what happened to grandpa at the the dentist and what happened to his molar. <laughs> Is someone dead? Do I need to go to the hospital? Otherwise That's what I mean. Like, let me know if it's an emergency or if there's something I can do. But otherwise, I don't need to know. I don't care. It's literally what the group chat's about this morning. Grandpa at the dentist and how he refused. He refused to brush his teeth this morning. No joke. That's what she put in there. Like, I don't care. I don't That's care. That's so gross. I know. <laughs> okay. I know that tells you how much I don't want to do class today. All right, come on, folks, join. I've joined. There's six people in here, and one of those is me. Come on. Miss, I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Ungodly hours just to chat. I know, right? Have some. Have a little respect. Have a little respect. I agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm already in too. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. All right, keep joining, people. Come on. There's like 20 of us in this in this group. Come on, give me a thumbs up when you've joined. Come on. Come on. Show the cocaine bear some respect. Come on. Mine's taking too long to load. It's taking too long to load. Oh, okay. Well, as long as you're trying, it'll load eventually. All right. Come on. I appreciate the effort. Okay. Remember, like we talked about yesterday, we don't like bugging you, but it's also hard when we don't get participation, right? So, all right, let's get started. Here we go. Okay. So as they do things, we don't have to do the free response. We'll just discuss them, but we'll do the multiple choice. But they talk to you about, and the whole goal of what I want you to do from this is why do we have money? Okay. And, um, and I think they do a good job of breaking down why money is a better system than a barter system. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Crash Course Economics. I'm Adrian Hill. And I'm Jacob Clifford. And today we're going to talk about money and finance. I know we said in the first episode that economics isn't really about money. Well, economics isn't about getting rich quick, but it all boils down to trading the things you have for the things you want. Like, I've got this giant zucchini, but I love that piece of pizza. Want to trade? No way. Okay, so what is the purpose of the money? The purpose of money is to get our wants and needs, okay? So the purpose of money is to get our wants and needs, okay? And they're going to explain to you why we need money and why money is more efficient than, let's say, a barter economy.
Imagine you live in a world without money, and you're a dentist that wants to go buy a car. First, you need to find a bunch of auto workers who need dental work. And if these workers don't want dental services and prefer being paid in something else like flat screen TVs, then you have to find TV manufacturers that have toothaches. Try posting that on Craigslist. This is called the barter system, and it takes a lot of time and energy. Of course, many people still barter for stuff, but for most transactions, we use money, which is a way more efficient way to do business. The people who really need dental care will pay you with money, which you can now use to buy a car. Economists point out that money serves three main purposes. First, it acts as a medium of exchange. It's generally accepted for payment for goods and services. Now, that medium of exchange means we're not stuck in the barter system. Next, money can be used as a store of value. The reason why a dentist doesn't usually accept fruit or baked goods is because you can't save those things up to go buy things like cars. Plus, bananas go bad pretty quickly in a safe deposit box. Money also serves as a unit of account. We don't measure the value of cars and bananas, muffins, or root canals. Instead, we use money because it's a standardized metric that allows us to measure the relative value of things. Okay, so you do need to answer this one. Let's do it together. So money is a blank, meaning it can be traded for goods and services. So it's a type of debt. Storage method. Storage method fundamental right or medium of exchange select your response select your response i'm voting so select your response all right so it is d medium of exchange right so it's a universal medium of exchange meaning universal that that we can store up, it doesn't go bad, it doesn't rot like a banana or fruit or something like that. And we can apply it towards so that, and I think it's a good example, if the dentist wants to buy a car, but what if the people at the car dealership don't want stuff from the dentist, then the dentist has to go find something that they want. It creates so much extra work. Whereas if we have this universal exchange, no, it's all, it's all good, Christian, no, no problem. Um, if we have this universal exchange, it just makes it easier. You can go directly to these people and get, and then they can use it then to get the thing that they want, okay? Um, and it doesn't have to be a specific object. Thanks. Most people assume that money is just cash and coins issued and endorsed by a government. Coins have been used for thousands of years and they're a great example of money, but technically money is anything that's used as a medium of exchange. For example, cigarettes were used as money in prisons until smoking bans were put in place. Nowadays, prisoners use postage stamps and even small pouches of mackerel as currency. Animals like cattle and sheep, also sacks of grain, all these have been used as money. Some societies even used feathers or shells. The indigenous people on Yap Island in the Pacific Ocean used money called rye stones. These were large donut shaped discs made out of limestone. The largest ones are around 10 feet that? wide and weigh four tons. The point is what economists consider money is anything that's accepted as a medium of exchange. And that's changed a lot over time. Today, cash and coins are often used as money since they're easy to carry around, physically durable and hard to counterfeit. But a a lot of money today doesn't end up in anyone's pocket or wallet, or duffel bags, or even wheelbarrows. It moves around electronically. Increasingly, people get paid in the form of checks or direct deposits into their bank. A lot of our money isn't physical, it's digital. It exists on some bank's computer. And as long as that computer is secure and the zombie apocalypse doesn't permanently knock out the power and your nation's monetary system is functioning as it should, those electronic dollars do all the things they're supposed to. Okay, so with which of the following statements would the host most likely disagree? Okay, so that means that three of these the host would support. We're looking for the one that the host would not support based on what they were just talking about. Okay, so A, anything can be used as money um, if it's accepted as a medium of exchange. Digital money is too risky and will lose uh, popularity soon. Cash and coins are still viable forms of money. And prisons um, have a unique and organized money system. All right. So which one do they disagree with? Do they disagree with? So it's like a lot of us are getting it B, right? Digital money, too risky and will lose uh, popularity soon. We're actually, seeing, we've talked about that. Right? We're seeing it over the last couple of decades and it will probably just continue. I think money will always kind of be there in some way, like physical money, but it's transferred that we still have money, but it's digital. So I don't put my hands on it, but I see its representation in my account, right? In that dollar sign of what I owe in my credit card or what I have in my checking account. You know, currency has value. It's just digital form now. I can't put my hands on it. And we've transitioned over to that pretty smoothly. People accept it. People embrace it. And as long as that's the key, you have to have faith from society. Mm -hmm. To do. Another form of digital money that you often hear about is Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin is a virtual currency that is not issued or regulated by a specific country. But since some people accept it as payment, many economists consider it money. Unlike other electronic currency, Bitcoin doesn't involve a bank. So people can, in theory, buy things more anonymously. This appeals to people who don't trust central banks and also people who want to buy illegal stuff online. That illegal trade means law enforcement and regulators are also very interested in Bitcoin. Bitcoin isn't only for internet drug deals though. There's a lot of speculation in Bitcoin, meaning people buy up Bitcoins hoping to turn a profit on them. This makes Bitcoin more of a speculative asset and limits its use in buying and selling actual goods and services. Could Bitcoin or another virtual currency be how everyone pays for things in the future? Who knows? But if anyone wants to give me 10 Bitcoin for this zucchini, we've got a deal. There's kind of a glaring question here. What makes these pieces of paper so valuable? Well, in the past, each dollar issued by the U.S. government was redeemable for a specific amount of gold. That was called the gold standard, and it meant that the government couldn't issue more money than it had in gold reserves. Back in the 1930s, the U.S. decided to move off the gold standard, and some people freaked out about not having something tangible to back our money. But it's important to remember that money, whether it's cash or gold or small pouches of mackerel, is all about confidence. The Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman said, the pieces of green paper have value because everyone thinks they have value. With that in mind, a gold standard, or even a macro standard, might not make money more valuable or reliable. A lot of economists agree with this, which is why no country uses the gold standard. There are calls by some politicians to bring it back, but that's probably never going to happen. Sorry, Ron Paul. Okay. So do you think um, back, going back to the gold standard would make money more valuable or reliable? And the reality is we haven't been on the gold standard for almost 100 years, 90 years, and stuff like that. And no country today has it because there isn't enough gold to back the amount of currency that we have. We, we have printed, and so it's just not possible. And now you think like going into things like crypto and stuff like that, like, like what would be the physical asset of that? And we've moved away from that. So like the economist said, as long as we have faith in the system and we we all endorse and believe it has value, then it has value. The moment we abandon that, that is when the dollar bill is just a piece of paper or that coin is just a hunk of metal. It doesn't actually have value. But if we all endorse it and say it does universally or majority, then you really don't have to have that backing. Okay, I know we said economics is not about the stock market, but now it's time to explain what it is and why it's important. The stock market is just one piece of something much bigger, the financial system. To understand the financial system, you need to picture two different groups. First, you have lenders. Sometimes these are corporations with a bunch of cash, but lenders can also be ordinary households, people like you and me. Us regular folks are going to need money in the future to retire or send our kids to college or go on a vacation to Yap Island. So we need a way to turn the money we have now into more money in the future. The second group is borrowers. There are several different kinds of borrowers. First, you have other households who want to borrow money to buy stuff like a car or a house. You also have businesses that have a great idea for a new product, but they have a problem. They need money to make the product, and they'll have money when the finished products are sold. But for now, they need to borrow money to invest in capital, things like machinery, tools, and factories and they'll pay it back once they make some sales. Basically, they need to buy stuff to produce other stuff. Third, you have governments who need to borrow money because they're spending more than they're bringing in. So you have lenders who have money now and want to turn it into more money in the future. And you have borrowers who need money now and will repay it in the future. The financial system is a network of institutions, markets, and contracts that brings these two groups together. Lenders put money into the financial system, which loans it out to borrowers. These borrowers pay back those loans with interest, which makes it worth the lender's time. Okay, so in the financial system, there is a blank relationship between lenders and borrowers. Okay, so is it A, mutual benefit? So they get along and they both benefit from the transaction. B, non-existent, they don't have a relationship. C, completely unregulated, so volatile or D, diminishing less and less. So what do we think based on what she's saying? Let's get some more responses. Okay, looks like we're getting it. All right, keep responding. So mutually beneficial, right? So 
if I, let's say, want to buy a house, the bank gives me money for that, all right? Because I don't have the money to get the house myself. So they give me money for that, all right? So now I've been enabled to get the house that I want, all right? Now I have to pay them back and I pay back with interest. So not only did I get the house I wanted by the bank lending me money, but the bank is making money off of the loan and the interest that I pay. So we both, it's mutually beneficial. I got the house I wanted, they make money off the loan. What's the point of giving a loan if you don't make money off of it, you know? So it's mutually beneficial to both of us in that transaction. All right, let's keep going. Let's go to the thought bubble. There are three ways this exchange takes place. The first is banks. A lender deposits money in a bank and then the bank turns around and loans that money to a family who wants to buy a house or a business that wants to expand. As those borrowers pay the interest on their loans, the bank takes part of that money to cover their costs and passes the rest along to the depositor. The second way lenders and borrowers link up is through the bond market. A government or a large corporation that needs to borrow money will sell bonds to lenders. A bond is basically an IOU in which the borrower agrees to pay regular interest payments and promises to repay all of the money back at a set date in the future. If that lender decides they'd rather have cash now, they're free to sell that bond to another party. The third way lenders and borrowers link up is through, you guessed it, the stock market. Say Jacob and I want to expand our lemonade business, but we don't have the money to do it. We could sell stock, which is basically slices of ownership in the company. Households get the stock and we get the cash. If our company profits in the future and we become lemonade moguls, we'll share some of those profits with the shareholders, or the shareholders can sell the stock at a higher price. Either way, they make money if the company's profitable. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So banks and bonds have something in common. They're dealing in something called debt. If you get a loan from a bank, or if you're a government that sells a bond, the amount you must repay is set. In almost all cases, you're obligated to pay back the amount you borrowed with a set amount of interest. Stocks, on the other hand, are known as equity. If a company enjoys high profits, shareholders get more money. If a company goes bankrupt, shareholders may get nothing. In the news, you'll hear about changes in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but fluctuations in stock markets are not reliable indicators of how the economy's doing. Often changes in the stock market are reactions to real or just perceived changes in economic fundamentals, like consumer confidence, the unemployment rate, and GDP growth. So what is the difference between debt and equity? So it's, it's a pretty simple conquest or concept. Debt is debt. Okay, so it's money owed, money that you owe that you don't have, okay? And equity is this thing that it's not necessarily money in your account. So let's say we'll use the simple example of like buying a house, okay? So if I buy a $300,000 house, all right, and I put $20,000 down to get in that house, let's just say, okay? So initially, I owe two hundred and eighty dollars in debt, and I have $20,000 equity. But let's say over a year or two, the value of that house goes up. Let's say it goes up to $325,000, Okay. So it's not that I put the $25,000 into it. Now, I did pay my mortgage, but that value that went up, I gained that as equity. So now on the $325,000 house, I have $45,000 equity, or let's say I've paid down my loan a little bit. So I only owe $270,000 now. So I have $55,000 equity and $270,000 debt. So equity can be gained not only by paying off the debt and so owning more of the asset or the asset or the value of that asset going up, okay? So there's different ways that equity can be determined, all right? I think they got a couple more things they're going to say and then we're about done. Growth. Bonds and stocks also have something in common. They're traded on markets for financial instruments. Bonds are debt instruments and stocks are equity instruments, but they're both pieces of paper that are traded on markets with many buyers and sellers. Banks, on the other hand, are financial institutions. With the help of the FDIC, they safeguard our money while making loans to individual households and businesses. So why do we even need this complicated financial system? Why don't households take their savings and lend them out directly? Well, if you want to loan out your life savings to your neighbor so he can launch his artisanal smartphone business, go for it. But that's a pretty risky bet, so you're more likely to use the financial system. Financial markets with instruments like stocks and bonds allow borrowers to crowdsource the money they need to borrow. They raise their capital from lots of investors and spread the risk around. Banks do the same thing. They accumulate small deposits from thousands of people and use that to make loans. It's like Kickstarter except better because you get money as opposed to an earnest thank you email. And from the lender's point of view, a financial system allows you to spread your savings over dozens or hundreds of different loans. 
All right, explain how financial systems minimize individual risks. So the key with investing, um, if you've ever heard the saying, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So as you get older and as you start investing in for retirement, maybe a 401k or an IRA, or you just like to invest in the stock market or something like that, you don't want to put all of your money into one industry, okay? Maybe just into the tech industry or crypto or um, clean energy or something like that. You want to put it in many different industries because as we see, what goes up must come down. And a lot of industries have ups and downs. So if you put mm -hmm. all of your money into crypto, what if crypto fails? If you put all your money into clean energy, what if that doesn't pan out? So you put a little bit of money into several things so that hopefully a couple of those will be really successful and gain you money to offset maybe the one or two things that don't do well. And it's about riding the waves and kind of giving yourself lots of options because not every single, it's like playing, not every single time are you going to hit a winner. So it's not worth the risk of all of your money. A few companies might go bankrupt and a few people might not pay back their car loans but those losses will be offset by borrowers that do pay back their loans. You don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. So that's money in the financial system. The thing to remember here is that this stuff is not just an abstraction or someone else's concern. Almost all of us are lenders and borrowers at some point in our lives, and understanding lending and borrowing is a big deal. While it might seem like you're borrowing from a faceless institution, you might be borrowing my money from that faceless institution. And I'm going to need that back if I can't get anyone to accept the zucchini as payment. Thanks for watching. All right. We're going to jump back over. Go ahead. And again, if you haven't, get your course arc and your notebook over. And we're going to continue working um, on getting this done and talking more about how the government interferes or helps to regulate the economy. All right. So we'll go to 9.5. We'll launch the course arc. Click that blue button. So on the course arc, we left off on the federal budget and fiscal policy page, so the fourth page, and then we need to have our notebook open. All right, and we did number five. So both of those need to be open. I'll give you a minute or two to get that done, and we'll get going. Go ahead and give me a clap when you have it on, or thumbs up. I don't care. Some indication. Some proof of life. <laughs> yeah, I've been had mine tabs already. Okay, awesome. All righty. So yesterday we left off, okay, and we ended class with talking about the four steps to creating a budget, okay? And we went over that in number five, beginning of class. So we're going to go to how financial decisions how financial decisions impact the economy. So basically, the government has this toolbox, okay? And I think this is a good analogy for it. So when they want to increase or boost the economy, keep us from going to a recession or get us out of a recession, they have to increase government spending. They have to cut taxes. Sometimes we get stimulus. But sometimes we get a little too high and prices get too high and it, we're buying and the value of money is decreasing. And we got to bring it back down. So they have to decrease demand, prices, output, interest rates, okay? Inflation. So they have to increase taxes, take away tax cuts. They have to decrease government spending. So reduce availability and increase um, interest rates. So if the government leaders wanted to spur economic activity, what tool would they select? All right. So if they want to increase, they would select increasing government spending and tax cuts, tax cuts, government spending. So this represents expansionary policy, which is the increase or expanding the economy, which we saw that at the beginning of the pandemic. So the government and the president and Congress did things to try to stimulate us to keep us from going into a recession. recession. But they kind of did it for, they stimulated us a little too long. And now we've overinflated, interest, interest rates um, were so low and it was so easy to get money that some people were borrowing too much. And the value of money was decreasing because of inflation. And we saw that. So now we're trying to correct that through contradictory policy, right? Bringing down interest rates, ending some of those stimulus programs. It's of kind of getting us back to reality because we went too high. Now, unfortunately, sometimes the drop becomes a little bit harder. All right. So if we go over to our notebook, it's fiscal policy, explain expansionary and um, contradictory policy. So the purpose, so the purpose of expansionary is to increase output and the purpose of contradictory is to decrease output. So we're doing number six. 
All right, method. So how do they do that? So looking back at the toolbox, how do they physically do that? So they do it through increased government spending, tax cuts, sometimes stimulus. How do you decrease it? Well, you decrease government spending through um, through spending for reducing spending, um, raising taxes, and increasing interest rates. All right, desired results. Okay, so what is why do this? So when you do expansionary, what's the desire? When you do um, contradictory, what's the desire? So expansionary is to encourage growth and prevent or come out of a recession. All right, um, whereas contradictory is to slow down the economy, fight inflation, like we're seeing right now. So we very much have seen examples of both of these in the last couple of years and one from the other, the expansionary and maybe going on with it too long. There were signs in 2021 of high inflation, gas prices, housing prices, cars, you know, kind of getting out of control. But we really didn't see intervention until mid 2022, you know, interest rates, the summer of 2022. So sometimes the government's slow to react um, when we see these issues. All right, let's keep going. And we have our next question. What percentage of GDP did spending by the federal and state local governments amount to in 2010? So it's asking us based on this graph. So if we look at federal spending, which is purple, so that's 1,786, so that's 17 or 1.7 billion, okay? Um, and then we look at local, so state and local tax or state and local spending, that's gonna be 1.2 billion. So we add these together, okay, those two together, uh, 12 plus 17 is about 29, and then you get the rest, so we're at about 30, okay? So that would be 3,000 billion, or 3.0 billion. I don't know how they want to say it. Okay? All right, and then we're going to go to the next page, effects of monetary policy. So what they're going to do is they're going to use the example of the Minions movie to kind of explain how the banking relationship and individuals and how sometimes that relationship changes depending on how the economy is. Okay. Hey, how are you doing, econ students? This is Mr. Clifford. Welcome to Econ Movies. Right now, we're going to talk about monetary policy by looking at the movie Despicable Me. Monetary policy is when a central bank or other regulatory agency changes the money supply to achieve specific economic objectives. What? Actually, it's not that complicated. The first thing that you need to know to understand monetary policy is the role of banks and bankers in the economy. Banks are financial institutions that link borrowers with lenders, and although sometimes they're perceived as evil, they're absolutely essential to the health of the economy. People with extra money deposit that savings in banks, and the bank turns around and loans that money out to businesses and individuals that need to buy something expensive. Before giving that loan, the bank analyzes the risk involved to make sure they get paid back. Do you have the audacity to ask the bank for money? Do you have any idea of the capital that this bank has invested in your crew? How can I put it? Let's say this apple is you. If we don't start getting our money back, the bank also charges an interest rate, which is basically the price of borrowing money. The lower the interest rate, the cheaper the loan and the easier it is to pay back. The higher the interest rate, the more expensive the loan and the more difficult it is to pay it back. Wait, stop right there, that's it. This scene with the pillars shows the relationship between interest rates and the overall economy. If the interest rate is really high, then less people are going to take out loans because they don't want to be crushed by that giant interest rate. Consumer spending on big ticket items is going to decrease and so the GDP is going to fall. But if interest rates are really low, the consumers can go and buy things like cars. The lower the rate, the more they can afford. So interest rates affect consumer spending, but they also affect business spending in the form of investment. Remember, investment is when companies buy machines, tools, factories to produce more stuff. If interest rates are really high and loans become more expensive, then companies are going to invest less and produce less and possibly even go out of business. The bank is no longer funding us. In terms of money, we have no money. <laughs> and if a lot of companies go out of business, that could cause a recession and a whole lot of unemployment. Now would probably be a good time to look for other employment options. So lending and interest rates affect the entire economy, but what affects interest rates? Well, the answer is the money supply, but who controls the money supply? The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States, and it's ran by Janet Yellen. 
It regulates banks and controls the money supply. Change in the money supply affects interest rates, which can affect the entire economy. That's called monetary policy. A committee of bankers chaired by Janet Yellen set target interest rates that signal the health and overall direction of the economy. An increase in the target range for the federal funds rate remains unlikely at our next meeting in April. But an increase in the target range could be warranted at subsequent meetings. There's two types of monetary policy. Expansionary monetary policy is when the Fed increases the money supply and puts more money in the system. This makes it easier for banks to loan out money, so it lowers the interest rates. That'll increase consumer spending and business spending, which will increase the GDP and expand the economy. Contractionary monetary policy is when the Fed decreases the money supply, causing interest rates to go up. That will decrease consumer spending and investment spending and slow down the overall economy. Now, the goal isn't to ruin the economy and cause unemployment. The goal is to fight inflation. In fact, some people say that inflation is the Fed's nemesis. Now, normally spending is a good thing, but if there's a whole lot of spending and we're not producing more stuff, then we're going to get higher prices. In that case, the Fed uses contractionary monetary policy to decrease the money supply, raise interest rates, and slow down the entire economy to fight inflation. It's like the Fed's private shrink ray. Actually, a Fed chairman many years ago joked the main job of the Fed is to take away the punch bowl once the party gets started. <laughs> some economists think the government shouldn't get involved in the overall economy. But other economists think that some fine tuning done by the Fed actually prevents some of the ups and the downs of the business cycle. Many economists think that economic calamities like the 2008 financial crisis would have been a whole lot worse if the Fed didn't step in. Now, either way, monetary policy along with fiscal policy are the two main weapons that the government uses to fight high unemployment and high inflation. Whether some banks are too big to fail or whether we need more banking regulation, one thing for certain, we need an effective way to make sure that worthy borrowers can buy things like homes or expand their business. I really don't see how we can afford this. Hey, Chillax, I'll just get another loan from the bank. They love me. <laughs> okay. Um, let's keep going. So we're going to go to the next page, limits of fiscal policy. All right. And if we go to thing, it says, okay. So um, number seven, look at figure 9.6. How does the graph explain why the government's fiscal policy is an effective tool for influencing the overall economy? And I think I actually jumped ahead too quickly. So let me go back one. My bad. Okay, so they was talking about this graph right here, this graph right here. Okay, sorry about that um, and stuff. All right, so number seven um, and stuff. So how does the graph explain why the government's fiscal policy is an effective tool for influencing overall economy? So even though the government spending didn't make up the overwhelming majority of spending, GDP spending in 2010, you can see it outspent private sector spending, okay? Private sector spending, domestic spending um, was about 2 billion, government spending was about 3 billion. So what that does is it shows that the government is putting into the economy, they are putting, they're encouraging jobs, they're encouraging expansion, and then it encourages the private sector to keep up, okay? So without government spending, there's a lot of jobs, millions and millions of jobs that wouldn't be, you know, that we wouldn't have. Myself and Miss C, you know, we are a result of, federal, state, local government spending, you know, so there's a lot of jobs. In fact, the largest employer in, in uh, Clark County is CCSD, you know, so um, it's, you know, tens of thousands of people work for the school district, meeting all the needs of the youth, people 18 and under, you know, so it's um, the, the principle of the story is that we need government spending or how we benefit from government spending, okay, because it definitely helps keep our economy going. All right, and then let's look at number eight. It says, read the quote from Professor David N. Wheel, then look at the figure, 9.7, explain how the illustration agrees or disagrees with the professor's observation. Okay, so this professor's observation is going to be on, it's one more, it's the limit of fiscal policy. So if you're looking at the tool, it's third from the bottom, limits of fiscal policy. Okay, so here's the quote. If economists forecast well, then the lag would not matter. They could tell Congress in advance what the appropriate fiscal policy is, but economists do not forecast well. Most economists, for example, badly underpredict 
uh, both the rise of unemployment in 1981 and the strength of recovery in late 1982. Um, absent accurate forecasting attempts to use discretionary fiscal policy to counter business cycles fluctuations are as likely to do harm as good. So for example, let's say in January, um, experts said that we were entering into a recession. Well, the reality was it was happening in 2022 and then they come out, or sorry, it was happening in 2021 and then they come out in 2022 and say, oh, it's happening. When all of us are like, yeah, are you kidding? It's it's happening. Not till March that the president says, all right, we got we to gotta do something to you know, to spur the economy and to correct this. And then in June or in July, then, you know, Congress starts to actually talk about it after the president brings it up. Then, you know, by the fall, there's new infrastructure. And it's not till end of, you know, the fall that, you know, 10 months later that we see actual response 10 months after the prediction. And by then there's already changes in the recession and in the um, either things have gotten worse or things have started to rebound. And so for sure, we've seen that, right? 2020, um, we saw reactions to keep us from a recession. And then there were signs in 2021 that in inflation was getting too high. Prices of houses were going up too fast. Prices of cars were going up too fast. Um, interest rates being so low, you know, it's people are overspending. Gas was another great example of that, you know. Um, inflation, just in general, the cost of everything was going up and it was getting worse. At first, it was 10 year high, then it was 20 year high, you know. And they didn't start reacting until summer of 2022 you know, adjusting interest rates and some sort of, and they're still adjusting after the fact. So sometimes that delayed response, it's not as helpful. Um, whereas if they're, cause they're not accurate in seeing the signs. In fact, a lot of people were denying it. They're like, no, we're not heading into recession. Everybody's like, are you kidding? So, and then now six months later, a year later, yeah, it's looking like a recession. And everybody else is going, well, we've been telling you that you just didn't agree with us. So oftentimes the reaction doesn't happen until it's obvious is sometimes one of the critiques. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're living a bit of that right now. A lot of it, that. A lot, a lot of that is the right thing to say. <laughs> a lot of that. Because look at like interest, interest rates haven't been this high in 25 years. Well, you know, it, that's mm -hmm. where the moderation is really important. Going so low, then that means you got to go high, you know, whereas keeping more of a balance, it regulates Interest rates have been ridiculous. They went down from November to like January, and then now they're like, it's almost like it feels like a roller coaster. Yeah, I saw the other day. It was like seven and a half or something for a 30. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, but we were already down to like five something in November, not November, but like December, a little bit of January. And out of nowhere, the Fed came back, made their reports, and then they were back mm -hmm. up. So people are falling out of escrow trying to buy a house because the rate goes up and they can't afford their mortgages by a couple hundred. Yeah. Well, and people don't realize like 1% in interest rate makes such a difference in payment. You know? So it, it really does make a huge impact. Huge, huge difference. Yeah. Okay. Let's wrap this up. Um, so um, we got most of the notebook done through number eight. The course arc is done. Okay. Here's your review sheet. If you want to go ahead and get this done tomorrow so that you are ahead of the game when we come back, here's the review sheet. I will also put it in the announcement for tomorrow, but nothing is technically due till the Tuesday after we come back. Okay. But that Monday, when we come back, I'm starting 9.6. We are done with 9.5. Okay. Um, and stuff. If you need anything tomorrow, come see me from 9 to 11.45. Have a wonderful spring break and make sure you do your attendance tomorrow. So log in in the morning, get it done, and then go back to bed. <laughs> so, all right. Have a great spring break and I will see you in a week and a half-ish. Okay. Thank you. Have a great break. Have a good day. Bye. You too. Bye. Thank you.